So the first thing I want to talk about is the truth about majoring in statistics and how that relates to me being a data analyst. The truth is that I don't use 90% of what I learned as a statistics student. And it's really unfortunate, but it's just the truth. Out of my job, most of what I do consists of SQL, it consists of R, and it consists of Tableau. And now I do a lot of presentation, a lot of communicating, but out of all those tools, I'm not doing a lot of pure statistical work. A lot of the work I do is data cleaning, pooling data, making visualizations, putting them into a dashboard. Now, if that doesn't sound exciting to you, maybe a data analyst isn't for you, but at least for what I'm doing as a data analyst, I was expecting to do a little bit more statistics. Now, I do want to insert a caveat here because I do work with a lot of people who do use statistics a lot more so than, than I do. I work with actuaries who use statistics all the time. I work with statisticians who obviously use statistics all the time and are performing statistical tests on hypotheses that they have. But personally, as a data analyst, as an entry-level data analyst, I don't think you're going to be using a lot of statistics. I think you're going to be using those skills that I talked about a second ago, SQL, R, Tableau, maybe Power BI, maybe some Excel, data ingestion, meaning data engineering, that kind of work. You're going to be doing a lot of that, and you're probably not going to be doing a lot of statistics. So if you are on your own statistics path and you're really highly focused on statistics, I'm not saying that you shouldn't focus on it because good grades are important and then it reflects on your resume. However, I am saying that just be prepared that your entry level role, you're probably not going to be using a lot of statistics. You just have to keep that in mind when you're searching for jobs. If that's something you want to do, then maybe you should be looking for more of a research role or more of an entry level statistician role. Good luck finding one of those. But for me, the statistics work I do use is the basics, the stuff you learned in high school, the stuff you learned in elementary school. I don't know whenever you learned it, but means, medians, ranges, that kind of thing. That's about the extent of the statistics knowledge that I use. However, I will say, since I do work with a lot of people who use statistics every day, I am interacting with statistics. I'm not, I'm just not using it in my day-to-day -day role. But if you want to be using statistics, an entry-level data analyst role, probably not going to be your best bet. So just keep that in mind. But that brings me into the next point, because if I'm not doing statistics all day, what other kind of roles or hats or things do I have to do on a day-to-day -day basis that doesn't involve statistics at all? And that brings me to the most underrated data job that not a lot of people talk about. However, this one is very popular, it is very high paying, and it is very high in demand. And it's not a data scientist, or it's not a data analyst, it's a data engineer. Now, if you aren't super familiar with the data field, what a data engineer does is basically they get the data in the correct format for use for all the other people I just mentioned, software developers, analysts themselves, any kind of analyst really, data scientists, whoever else is going to be using data, they ingest that data into a particular location or usually a database and they get it into the correct format, they clean it up and they might pull it into your project for you. However, as an analyst or a data scientist or a business analyst or software, software developer, you might not actually have access to a data engineer. You might have to learn how to do some of that on your own. And so about 50% of my work at least to start over the past two months has been that it's been data engineering. So I take the raw data for wherever it comes from. I pull it into the application that I'm using and I have to format that data and get it out of its ugly, nasty format. I have to get it for the correct time period. I want the correct rows I want, and I'm using where clauses and SQL to get those. I'm joining two tables together so that I can get all of the data that I want, not just some of it. And sometimes that that work goes past just SQL. I have to pull in a certain part of it using one SQL statement from one location, grab another from another, and then I'll join those in R so that I have my final data set. Once I have my final data set, I might be doing something different with that. I might be writing it to a different database. I might be pulling it in and saving it to my local hard drive to use on a different project or in a different software. But a lot of what I do is data engineering. I've realized that a lot of what anybody does that I work with is a lot of data engineering. It might not be data engineering in the classical sense, like if you look up what a data engineer does, but it is data formatting. And you need to understand that no matter what role you go into, if it's an analyst, if it's a data scientist, if it's a business analyst, a software developer, and you're working with data, you're probably going to have to do the same thing. And it's going to take up a large percentage of what that project actually is. Now, I told you what you might have to do, and I told you what I did. But how do you actually do it? The simplest way I can put what data engineering actually is, is you're taking data that's untidy, sitting in different locations, 
the date times are showing up as integers and you need them as date times. Maybe you need to calculate another field that you want and you know how to calculate that or you don't know how to calculate that. Data engineering is the process of taking all of those separate pieces, putting them together, getting it into a tidy format so that you or somebody else can use that data and it's accessible and easy to understand. So what goes into this is the knowledge of SQL or a tool in another tool, something like SAS or R to actually put all that together. And then the other part of it is you have to actually understand the data. And this is hard, especially if you're just walking into a, an industry or a company, they're going to have their own processes for storing data. And you have to really understand that and understand what the underlying data actually is telling you. And there might be some resources at your new company or wherever you're going to be on how to understand this data, like resources that tell you what these fields actually represent. If you're trying to pull for a particular purpose, how you would do that but if you don't you're gonna have to figure that out on your own and ask a bunch of questions but it does take a long time just keep that in mind data engineering super underrated and if you're interested in data at all this might be a career opportunity that you can look into also if you've made it this far in the video and i'm talking about statistics and data analysts and all these different data jobs if that's the kind of thing you're interested in you should probably consider subscribing to the channel because i talk about stuff like this all the time but let's get back to the video but now that we have our data in the correct format your data analyst such as myself what if you don't know what you're doing as a data analyst so this is kind of my segue into how i use chat gpt as a data analyst now i want to say this beforehand i don't use chat gpt for every one of my tasks there's no way it, it it's not that perfected yet however i will say there has been four to five cases as a data analyst where i've used chat gpt to solve a problem and the most common case for these is that I have some comp some kind of complicated code that I just don't really want to take the time to think through and map out how I actually have to write that. So I go to ChatGPT and talk to ChatGPT like I'm talking to a coworker. Also, fair warning, don't ever put like what your actual data is in there. Just don't do it. it there's safety concerns, obviously. But you can craft a test case in your in your head that represents what your data actually looks like. But I'll say I have this this case. I have these three columns and I want to check these three columns for certain values. If all of this is true, then make a new value that says blank. And for all of these different cases, I've had a few different cases with a similar setup to that. All of them, I've either reached my goal and actually completed it or I partially reached it and then been able to figure it out on my own through chat GPT. So one of the specific cases I remember is similar to how I set up. You have three different columns. You need to check all those three column values. And it's a very complicated if else statement with a bunch of different clauses and if statements and else statements. It's disgusting. So I just didn't want to logic myself through it. I just wanted chat GPT to do it for me. And after four or five back and forth for chat GPT, it gave me a usable format that I could start with and that I could put in my own column name and put in my own data and it would actually go through and do that. Now it took a little bit of reformatting and a little bit of troubleshooting. But I had ChatGPT set me up and put me on the right path to completing this goal. And finally, I completed the task and got that extra column that I wanted. So if you're a data analyst or you're anything like that, ChatGPT is not going to answer your questions for you. You can't have no idea what you're doing and have ChatGPT tell you what to do. Because if you do that, you're going to get something wrong and you're not going to know why. The nice thing about ChatGPT for me is that I have a pretty good idea of what I'm doing in R. And so if I ask a specific R question and maybe I have a decent idea on what I would do, I just don't want to, you know, go through the process of going to stack exchange saying, how do I do this? And then pulling that and trying to apply it to my own situation. I'll set up my situation with chat GPT. I'll ask it or I'll tell it what I want it to do. And then I'll ask it, can you tell me how to do that? It says, yes, it'll show me something. I say, mm, that doesn't look quite right. Let's try changing this column to this. And I actually wanted to say if this column equals this value, then this, and then it'll reiterate and go through again and it'll type it out and then it'll explain its code. So it's actually like, just like talking to one of my coworkers, like, Hey, I have this problem. Could you help me? And that's kind of how you have to approach chat GPT as an analyst or a statistician or anything like that. But it is a great resource and it is a valuable tool. If you haven't tried it yet, go ahead and try that out. And now, finally, I want to reiterate a point that I've made a few times. And it's one of the most important things I have to do as a data analyst, at least in my opinion, but it's going to be something that's going to come across, whether you're a statistician, a data scientist, a business analyst, a project manager, a software developer, you're probably going to have to present. I, breath I bring this up today because I actually had a presentation today and I constantly have meetings at work that I have to talk to a bunch of different types of people. I have to talk 
talk to end users. I have to talk to other analysts. I have to talk to my managers. So communication, I need to reiterate and stress that communication is one of the most important skills that you're going to have as any type of analyst or data role. So a little bit of backstory on the presentation I had today. I'm helping build a tool and I need to display this tool and showcase how it's actually going to help other analysts on the team. So I go into the tool, me and my coworkers, we are presenting and we needed we need to come up with a use case for these analysts that they're actually they would actually use in real life. The goal of this is to show that the tool we're building is useful and that they can use it. So they need to go in, give us feedback, try it out with a specific use case in mind, give us feedback on the tool's ability to answer that question. So you can't just go in and say, yep, here's the tool, here's what it can do. That's not really impactful. If you want them to use it, you should come up with a use case that this specific group of people would actually do. So that's what we did. We defined a specific business problem that they have tried to solve before or they have solved before or something similar to what they've done before. And then we went in the tool that we're building and we're like, okay, let's set up the problem. We're looking at blank population with blank issue and living in blank. Okay. So then we go in and we're like, okay, here's this problem set up. Here's how we would do this in this tool. You go through, you select this population, blah, blah, blah. And then if you want to look at this information, you go to this section. And you have these different options in this section. But if you want to look at this information and you click this section, but the ultimate goal here with communication is that you need to showcase value. You don't just want to be talking and umming and humming and hawing. You want to display value and you want to give a sense of specifically what your problem is or how you're going to help somebody or give clear answers to a question that you're asked. Partially, that was the reason that I started this YouTube channel. I wanted to work on my communication and I'm hoping that for people who are watching these videos over and over again, you're seeing my improvement in communication. At least that's what I hope. So ultimately you're looking to provide value and you want to get to your point as concisely and as clearly as possible. So you don't want to go on a random tangent that really doesn't mean anything. You want to get bullet points and if you need more clarification, you can get, dive in a little bit deeper, but you want to showcase the value upfront and then ask for questions and feedback after that.